my life flows on. It was also at Cambridge that I met Reverend Henslow. He was the first man to paint a portrait of every bird in North America. Oh, Captain, my Captain, the fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rack. The prize we sought is won. The port is near, the bells I hear, the people all exulting, while follow eyes a steady keel, this vessel grim and daring. But oh heart, 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 the bleeding drops of red were on the deck. My captain lies, fallen, cold, and dead. Oh, Captain, my Captain, rise up and hear the bells. Rise up, for you the flag is flung, for you the bugle trills, for you bouquets and ribbon wreaths, for you the shores are crowding, for you they call the swaying mass, their faces eager turning. Oh, Captain, dear Father, this arm beneath your head it is some dream that on the deck you've fallen cold and dead. My captain does not answer. His lips are pale and still. My father does not feel my arm. He has no pulse, no will. The ship is anchored safe and sound. Its voyage closed and done. From fearful trip, the victor ship returns with object won. Exalt, O shores, and ring, O bells. But I, with mournful tread, I walk this deck. My captain lies, fallen, cold, and dead. I wrote that poem shortly after I heard the news of Abraham Lincoln's assassination. Uh, the war had just ended. I went home to visit my family in Brooklyn. I remember it was April. Ever and anon the scent of lilacs will remind me of our fallen martyrs, death. Lilacs by the back dooryard bloomed. I remember it was a rainy evening, April 14th, 1865. I was walking down the street when I saw the newsboy with a late evening extra, extra, the president's been assassinated. Never had such foul words emanated from such a handsome young boy. Disbelieving, I purchased a paper and I read it in the gaslight. And I wept. I wept. I was embarrassed for a moment to be weeping here in this pool of light until I realized in the wake of the newsboy every man who purchased a paper also wept. I am here this day to share with you my memories of our beloved president, to share with you my poems and my stories of the recent uncivil war. It is amazing to me that Mr. Lincoln knew this book. As the story goes, his partner, Billy Herndon, without a doubt, had one of the best libraries in central Illinois. He had a standing offer with the booksellers in Chicago. If anything was creating a stir in Boston or Philadelphia or New York, he wanted a copy. A clerk says that one day they were reading my leaves of grass, and discussing its merit. When Mr. Lincoln came in, and he listened for a moment, and then he snatches the book up off the table, and he sprawls out on that horsehair sofa that was never quite long enough for him, and he began to read my poems. The thought of it. <laughs> what poems did he love best? What poems may have caused him some consternation? I wonder, him knowing the open road, if he enjoyed my song of democracy, 
as Mr. Lincoln liked to say. I was born in Kentucky, raised in Indiana, but grew to be a man in Illinois. He knew the song of the open road. I'm sure that this poem gave him some pleasure. Song of the open road. Afoot and light-hearted, I take to the open road. Healthy, free, the world before me, the long brown path before me, leading wherever I choose. Henceforth, I ask not good fortune, I am good fortune. Henceforth, I whimper no more, postpone no more, need nothing. Strong and content, I travel the open road. I think heroic deeds were all conceived here in the open air. I think I could stop here myself and do miracles. I think whatever I meet on the open road I shall like, and whatever beholds me shall like me. I think whoever I see must be happy. From this hour, freedom. From this hour, I ordain myself loose of ordinary limits and imaginary lines, going where I list, my own master, total and absolute. I inhale great draughts of air. The east and the west are mine. The north and the south are mine. I am larger than I thought. I did not know I held such goodness. Now I see the secret of making the best persons. It is to grow in the open air and to eat and sleep with the earth. Here is a test of wisdom. Only the kernel of every object nourishes. Only the kernel of every object nourishes. Alans, come forth. Whoever you are, come forth. You must not stay in your home, though you built it. Alans, come forth out of your dark confinement. Have the past struggles succeeded? What has succeeded? Yourself? Your nation? Nature? Now understand me well. It is provided in the essence of things that from any fruition of success shall come forth something to make a greater struggle necessary. My call is the call of battle. I nourish active rebellion. I give you my hand. I give you my love, more precious than money. I give you myself. Will you give me yourself? Will you come travel with me? Shall we stick by each other as long as we both shall live? Shall we? Shall we stick by each other as long as we both shall live? Mr. Lincoln traveled these roads. Not once but twice, he built a flatboat and headed down the Ohio or the Illinois River and down the Mississippi all the way to New Orleans. I was in New Orleans about the same time that he was. I had been working for a newspaper in New York and at the theater one evening I met a man who was looking to hire an editor for a, a newspaper he had just purchased, the New Orleans Crescent. I took the job. I took a train to Chicago and a steamboat down the Illinois and down the Mississippi. I was there in New Orleans just a few years after Mr. Lincoln's trip. When Mr. Lincoln was in New Orleans, it was the first time that he ever saw a slave at auction. I wonder if this poem might have caused him some consternation. A slave at auction. I help the auctioneer. The slothen does not half know his business. Gentlemen, look on this curious creature. Whatever the bids of the bidder, they cannot be high enough for him. For him, the globe lay preparing for quintillions of years without one animal or plant. For him, the revolving cycles truly and steadily rolled. In that head, the all-baffling brain. In it and below it, the makings and attributes of heroes. Examine these limbs, red or black or white. 
They are very cunning in tendon and nerve. They shall be stripped that you may better see them. Exquisite senses, life-lit eyes, pluck, volition, flakes of breast muscle, pliant backbone and neck, flesh not flabby, good-sized arms and legs, and wonders within there yet. Within there runs his blood, the same red running blood that jets and streams in your heart. There, all passions and desires, all reachings and aspirations, do you think they are not there because they're not expressed in parlors and lecture rooms? This is not only one man. He is the father of those who shall be fathers in their turn. In him, the start of populous states and rich republics. Of him, countless embodiments and enjoyments. How do you know who shall come from the offspring of his offspring through the ages? Who might you find you have come from yourself if you could trace back through the centuries? Maybe that last sentence caused him some consternation, knowing that Lincoln's mother may have been an illegitimate child. Pause with me and consider it for yourself. Who might you find you have come from? Yourself. If you could trace back through the centuries. Who knows from what root we have sprung? Who knows what hope might spring forth from us? I shall not forget the first time I saw Mr. Lincoln. He had just won the White House and he had taken the train to Washington City. When he stopped off in New York, there was a very large crowd. I had a capital view of it all. I was riding with a teamster, a friend of mine on a wagon, perched above the crowd, 10,000 strong. I saw, like Moses parting the Red Sea, a shabby hack, a carriage, pulled by a couple of black horses. The crowd parted and they paused in front of the Astor House Hotel. Mr. Lincoln stepped out that long, lanky frame of his. Arms and legs seemed too long for his torso, and that stovepipe hat exaggerated his height. It was the first time I saw that face. Have you seen this face? One side seems to be smiling, and the other side seems to have been kicked by a mule. Grieving. No poet or portrait can capture the complexity of that face. The crowd was strangely silent as he surveyed the scene, stretched once more and climbed the steps to the hotel. He turned and faced us. There seemed to be an unspoken agreement If his friends did not clap and cheer, then his enemies would not jeer. Though I assure you, there are many a pistol and knife hidden in a breast coat, awaiting a tumultuous riot. For you must know, Lincoln had few friends in New York City. We had voted overwhelmingly for Seward, Lincoln's rival in his bid for presidency. He entered the hotel, and the crowd dispersed. But I saw Mr. Lincoln many times after that, for even before he had taken the sacred oath of office, southern states began to secede. Now when the war began, I was too old to take up a pistol or a sword against my fellow human. And being a Quaker, I think you would call me a conscientious objector. But my little brother, he joined. And because he was older than some of the other soldiers, he quickly climbed to the rank of captain. So imagine my horror when I opened the Brooklyn Eagle and I found his name among the dead and fallen. 
I borrowed money from a friend, and, and I purchased a ticket for a train as close as I could get to the front line in Fredericksburg. But while I was transferring trains in Baltimore, someone picked my pocket. Thank God I still had my ticket stub. And I arrived as close to the front lines as I could get with nothing but a little hope, hoping to recover my brother's corpse and bring him home for a proper burial. I searched the piles of the dead for days. Every morning a fresh list was published of those that had died through the night and I could not find his name upon it. On the third day I found him sitting up in a hospital tent. It seemed that a shrapnel of a shell had grazed his cheek, a few stitches, and he would be fine and dandy. I stayed by his side and I tended his wound. I spent several days in the hospitals, and I found my calling. During the war, I served our nation as a nurse in the hospital tents. I have seen a piece of candy, a slice of orange, or a pitcher of milk cure a fatal wound with a bit of kindness. I wasn't the only one who served in the hospital tents. Julia Ward Howe, a friend of mine, friend of Emerson and Thoreau from Boston, because she was well educated, she was assigned the task of sitting with a dying soldier every night and transcribing his last words his last will and testimony, and it broke her. Knowing that every soldier she passed the night with would be dead by morning, she snapped. She fled home to Boston. When she met with her minister for solace, he said, Julia, you're a writer. Write your way out of it. She said she wrote this poem two by two by two at two o'clock in the morning with two inches of pencil and two inches of candle. She wasn't sure which would run out first, the candle or the pencil. She wrote furiously, you know the hymn, the battle hymn of the Republic? Sing it with me if you like. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah, his truth is marching on. I, too, spent many a night with a dying soldier, holding his hand and transcribing his last words, and then after he passed, adding a few words of my own. I understand that these letters are still appearing in attics in Wisconsin and Illinois and Iowa. I remember many a night. After I'd spent a long night with a dying soldier, I'd be walking back to my quarters. And as I was ho heading home at dawn, Mr. Lincoln would be heading to the White House. For in the heat of the summer, he, he spent his time at the old soldier's home at the edge of town. And every morning as he rode into work, I would be walking towards my home to sleep. We never spoke. I would doff my hat at him, and he might tip his hat at me. But when I gazed into his eyes, when I gazed into his eyes, I saw something there. The grief that I carried for the dying soldier I had passed the night with, he carried the grief of the entire nation. He who had lost a son in the White House shortly after they had moved in, whose son was now fighting as an assistant to General Grant. He carried the grief of every parent who lost a child. And he came down off the pedestal that we're apt to build for him. And he became a man. To the reason you have invited him here this day the death of Mr. Lincoln. The war had just ended. Lee and Grant had met at Appomattox and the treaties had been signed. And over all the perfume of victory, the sweet heavenly perfume 
when these United States were reunited. Lincoln, it was in all the papers, was going to the theater. I had seen him there myself quite often. I find it tragically ironic that he, one of the greatest players on the world stage, was a fan of these jackstraws with their face paint and flatulent text. He'd invited Ulysses S. Grant, but he had declined. If Grant had been there, how things might have been different. Eventually, some, I believe it was, a second lieutenant Rathbone and his fiancée joined he and Mary. Poor, poor Mary. It was the first time she had smiled in months since the death of her poor son in the White House. The play was Our American Cousin. It was wildly popular in Great Britain because it made fun of us Americans. It would be completely unforgettable if not for what happened in the seating, the audience, that evening. John Wilkes Booth, he knew this theater. He had crossed these boards. Now, John Wilkes Booth's older brother, Edwin Booth, without a doubt, was one of the best Shakespearean actors of our time, clearly Lincoln's favorite. One time when Lincoln's oldest son was elbowed from a train track and knocked onto the tracks as the train was approaching, Edwin Booth grabbed him by the scruff of his neck and jerked him back upon the platform, saving Robert Todd Lincoln's life. Edwin Booth will be remembered as one of the greatest Shakespearean actors of all time. He traded letters with Mr. Lincoln. But John Wilkes Booth, second rate at best, he had been planning to kidnap the president, hold him for ransom, and negotiate an end to the war that was favorable to the South. But then the war ended. <coughs> and his plan for kidnap turned to assassination. He knew the moment in the play when there'd be <laughs> polite applause and then the stage would be vacant and he could claim it for his own. The actual sound, not much louder than two hands clapping, as John Wilkes Booth shot Mr. Lincoln in the back, the coward, shot him in the back of the head. Who heard it? But surely a thrill went through the audience as Booth stepped up onto the banister of the presidential box and when he leapt to the stage 14 feet below, his boot heel was caught in the American flag. The American flag tripped him and he fell hard. When he landed, he broke his ankle. But the adrenaline of what he had done, he felt nothing. Imagine you are in the audience. Who is this man? Where has he come from? He stands up with his raven black hair and basilisk eyes in the gaslight. And he fairly spat, sick, semper, tyrannous, death to all tyrants. Again, the audience is stunned. What could these words mean? As he turns and marches off the stage, there is no doubt he has rehearsed this a thousand times in his own mind. And you hear, barely hear, horse hooves on cobblestones as he makes his getaway. And then, from the presidential box, a woman's voice shrieks, was it Mary? Poor, poor Mary. He has shot the president. The president is dead. Still stunned silence for a moment before pandemonium erupts. They rush the stage. The actresses, their face paint streamed with tears. Is there a doctor in the house? 200 soldiers burst in with bayonets drawn. Out of the way, you sons of... And into this, his blood, the greatest blood our nation hath borne, lies bleeding like fruit rotting on the grass. It took nearly a dozen hours for death to claim him as they carried his body across the street and lay it in a bed not long enough. His cabinet wept. The nation wept. At first they wouldn't even let Mary in to see her beloved. 
And with his blood, the war has ended. His blood seals the fate of the nation. Several million souls are freed, free at last. Lord Almighty, truly free. And these United States become the truly united States of America. And from one wing of the theater, the muse of tragedy, and the other wing, the muse of history, and the curtain falls. And some great poet, a thousand years hence, will help us to make sense of what his death means for the nation. O oh, captain, my captain, the fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rack. The prize we sought is won. The port is near. The bells I hear. The people all exulting while follow eyes. The steady keel. The vessel grim and daring. But oh heart, heart, heart. The bleeding drops of red were on the deck. Our captain lies fallen, cold, and dead. Oh, captain, my captain, rise up and hear the bells. Rise up, for you the flag is flung, for you the bugle trills, for you bouquets and ribbon wreaths, for you the shores are crowding, for you they call the swaying mass, their faces eager turning. Captain, Dear father, this arm beneath your head, it is some dream that on the deck you've fallen cold and dead. My captain does not answer. His lips are pale and still. My father does not feel my arm. He has no pulse, nor will. The ship is anchored safe and sound, its voyage closed and done. From fearful trip, the victor ship returns with object one. Exalt, O shores, and ring, O bells. But I, with mournful tread, I walk this deck. My captain lies fallen cold and dead.